Yosha, who is the, it's the actual name of the uh, of the individual that Christians have uh, misnamed Jesus, uh, when he was uh, challenged by a, a statement that would have resolved an immediate need, hunger, to turn a stone into bread, uh, he rather just saying, "No, nah, I'm not going to do that. No, nah, really, that's uh, don't see any reason for that." He cited the Torah, and it should be a lesson to anyone who wants to follow Yahshua's example. You know, like, if you really were interested in following Yahshua, A, you would learn his name, and B, you would do what he did. And so when confronted with a challenge, he didn't quote Paul. When, uh, when trying to defend uh, religion, <laughs> we didn't have a religion to defend, he most certainly didn't quote Paul, which is what Christians all seem fixated on doing. No, he quoted the Torah. And this was his statement. Uh, he read from the, uh, cited from, uh, verbatim from the Torah, uh, talking about why you ought not um, uh, focus on love and bread. And he, this is, happens to be the context of the statement that he made the citation out of. And the reason that's important is because when you see a statement that he's making, it should direct your attention to where that statement is within the text of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. A great example of that is that Christians are absolutely rendered dumbfounded by Yosha's statement, my God, my God, why have you deserted me, as he was hanging on the upright pole on Passover. Uh, because it renders the, the myth of Christianity completely uh, defunct. Uh, because he could not have been the totality of God, as was uh, claimed by at the Council of Nicaea to create this new religion fixated on a man. He could not have been the totality of God if God loved him. And more important than all of that, God could not have died for your sins if God left the man hanging on that pole. And so they're absolutely dumbstruck by that statement, which is why you'll never hear a sermon on it, because Yosha's statement literally craters the entire myth of the Christian religion. But if you were to do what we're doing on this statement, and you were to search for what he said, what you find is that almost everything he said can be found in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. There's almost nothing that uh, Yosha says that wasn't previously recorded in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. That's why he is the living manifestation of Yahweh's word. And on that particular quote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you separated yourself from me? You find the quote is in the uh, 22nd Psalm. And then, and then when you read the 22nd Psalm, what you find is he's explaining exactly what he's doing there. He's explaining what's going to happen to his physical body. He's explaining what's going to happen to his soul. And he is explaining what's going to happen to Yahweh's spirit and how all of them are going to separate and then be united again on the Bukhotam after the fulfillment of Passover and Matzah. It's a wonderful explanation of how Yahweh went about honoring the promises that he made to make us immortal, to make us perfect, and to adopt us into his children through his covenant. And so, you want to always look at what Yahweh cited to understand why he quoted from there, because of the teaching that's associated with it. So here, this is now even before Yahshua begins his ministry. This is before the Sermon on the Mount. He uh, is in a conversation with the uh, the adversary, Hasatan, Satan, and he is hungry, and he's um, saying, hey, man, why don't you turn this rock into bread? I mean, you can do it. And this is the context of the discussion in the Torah that he quoted from to explain why he's not going to do it. And that's why we're looking at this particular statement. It, it is, and you might say, wait a minute, you're, you're devoting this hour of the program here, week after week now, to exposing the 
the errant nature of Paul's letters. So why are we focused on this? This is not one of Paul's letters. Well, the reason is we began this by looking at four statements that Paul made in the heart of his letter to the Galatians, where he took statements out of the Torah and prophets, truncated them, means he, he, uh, he took only a small part of a statement, removed it from its context, misquoted what God had to say, to give the impression that God was endorsing something that was the opposite of what he was actually saying. And I said that that is inappropriate on every possible level. Misquoting God is inappropriate. Um, taking something out of context is inappropriate. Uh, to misrepresent what someone is saying is inappropriate. And then to, unders but to underscore why those things are wrong and therefore would discredit Paul's letters from being considered valid, I thought we would examine how... Yosha handled exactly this same situation. If he was going to cite the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms in an answer, A, would he do so comprehensively so we know, so that the statement's not misrepresented, would he do so accurately, rendering the, uh, the words as, uh, as specifically as they were originally written, and three, would he quote from a section where when you read the, the section, that discussion in context, that it is consistent with the answer he's giving. Because if so, Yosha's example is the antithesis of Paul's example. And that's how we turned here. So, he said, now this is Moshe summarizing the Torah teaching and guidance to the children of Israel before they enter the promised land. And he said, all of the terms and conditions, the mitzvah, which beneficially and for the sake of the relationship, Asher, which I have instructed, Shawal, provided by way of guidance, this day, for you to genuinely choose and continuously observe, Shamar, marvelous term. It means use your eyes to read and then your mind to think about what you are examining. For the purpose of approaching Approaching what? Now we're approaching the promised land, approaching uh, Yahweh's home. Now the promised land serves as a metaphor for us spending eternity camping out with God in his universe for the purpose of approaching law by actually responding and engaging Asha, by acting upon these terms and conditions which you have observed so that you choose to genuinely and continuously live. Eternal life, according to this statement, is a choice. We choose life when we choose to observe the terms and conditions of the covenant, the mitzvah, the codicils of the covenant. When we choose to observe them, when we choose to examine them, we, and then we act upon them, we are declaring that our choice is to live forever. That's what this says. Powerful, isn't it? And in addition, you choose to be totally and completely great, actually increasing in every possible way. Well, this is the, the, the part of this covenant relationship. Uh, there's lots of parts of the covenant relationship, but this is a really an important aspect of it that very few people recognize. Once you choose life, once you choose to participate in the covenant because you've focused on and you've acted upon the terms and conditions of the covenant, which is the first part of this, then God's not only going to cause his children to be immortal because he doesn't want his children to die, but he's also going to empower his children and make them great in every possible way. And part of that greatness is our flaws are removed. So we no longer have any limitations. The other aspect is that we are transformed from being material and being a physical being with all of its liabilities and limitations to being a spiritual energy-based construct, which is infinitely uh, more powerful, more uh, capable. As a spiritual energy-based being, for example, we can go explore not only this solar system, but but the entire galaxy, and not only this galaxy, 
but every galaxy, whereas a physical being, we can't even get beyond the moon. And as a spiritual being, we can actually explore the building blocks of, of matter, how energy is controlled as matter, and what, what atoms and molecules and electrons and protons and neutrons and quarks and leptons, and how that all works together. We'll be able to even explore down inwardly. But also, as energy, we are vastly more capable than every aspect of life and exploration and capacity. And so that's the other part of it. If, if you want to be made greater than you are, if you want to live forever, then the answer is to closely examine and carefully consider the mitzvah, the terms and conditions of the covenant. That's how this conversation, this advice from Moshe, who was asked to scribe the Torah, is that's what it's communicating to us. Your option, these are, this is his guidance, uh, based upon having listened to Yahweh's instructions. So that you will be pleased and arrive, and so that you will become an heir. Uh, so it's by focusing on the terms and conditions of the Torah and acting upon them that we are made immortal, that we are empowered, but also so that we can arrive. Arrive in the promised land, which means arrive to the point where, you know, in, in history, in, uh, in 2033, you're 6,000 young, you're either going to arrive in the promised land and spend the millennial Shabbat celebrating Sukkah with Yahweh, or you're either going to not exist anymore, your soul will be uh, annihilated, or you'll be incarcerated forever in Sheol, separated from God. You want to arrive. This is the place you want to arrive. Because when you arrive, you're arriving before Yahweh. You get to camp out with him. So this is not just for them. It's for us. And so this being made immortal, this being empowered, being enriched in this way, through the acceptance of the terms and conditions of the covenant, which you've taken the time to observe, also enables you to arrive before Yahweh in the promised land and to become an heir. Now, in virtually every civilization throughout time, in every legal system, you are an heir to your father's fortune. We inherit from our parents. So this infers that we're being adopted into his covenant family, and that's how we receive the inheritance of our father. We're continuing to consider Yosha's response to Hasatan, uh, and uh, in that he cited a passage from the Torah to explain why uh, he thought that uh, Satan's uh, advice was uh, inappropriate. And that particular statement begins that, uh, by saying all of the terms and conditions which beneficially I have instructed uh, this uh, day for you to genuinely choose to continuously observe for the purpose of approaching by actually responding uh, to them and engaging so that you may genuinely and continuously live. And, uh, and in addition, that you may be totally and completely great, actually increasing in every possible way. And so that you will be pleased when you arrive. And so that you will become an heir. An heir means you get to inherit everything that, that it is God's to give. That is the, the purpose of the covenant is we inherit God's power. We, in God, we inherit God's uh, riches. And his riches are are mostly in the uh, in the area of uh, of education, what we come to learn uh, by being with him. Accompanied in the realm, Ha Eretz, uh, which beneficially Yahweh has promised in a sworn oath to your father, Shabbat. Shabbat is the basis of Shabbat. It is the uh, uh, word that that Yahweh uses when he's trying to explain his fascination with his fixation on his his insistence on us paying attention to the seventh day is because seven and uh, based upon Shabbat is a promise or oath. God is promising to bring us together on the seventh day. 
promise and seven are synonymous in Hebrew. So that's the whole fam that's the whole equation. That that six, which is the number of man who was created on the sixth day, is a carbon based life form with the atomic number of six, plus God who is one, when we're brought together, that's that's doing so is God's promise and uh, and it is his desire. That's why the covenant is central to the Torah. So we'll be accompanied in the realm beneficially by Yahweh. Uh, according to the promise and sworn oath that he has made to our fathers. Now, there's only one promise that God made to our fathers. And it, you would think at this point that you'd, you'd put it together. And again, this is how we go about thinking so that we understand what God is saying. He began this with mitzvah. Well, when you study mitzvah, you come to realize that the only valid definition of mitzvah that works in the context of this statement is terms and conditions of the covenant. Terms and conditions specifically of the relationship agreement that is the covenant. There's only one promise that Yahweh made to us through our fathers. And that's the promise that he began with Abraham and then reaffirmed with Yishak, his son, and then reaffirmed again with Jacob, his grandson. And True Jacob renamed him Yisrael to say this promise is for all of those who uh, engage and endure with God. And in that promises, and there are five um, very specific promises that serve as the benefits of this covenant relationship. There are also five terms and conditions. God is saying, you ought to pay attention to those terms and conditions of the covenant because you'll want to receive the benefits and those this is the promise that he made to our fathers so that they too along with us could become heirs and when you put these things together you realize there's only one possible um, subject that Moshe was inspired to talk to us about and that is that we should observe the terms and conditions of the covenant so that we come to understand them and therefore we respond to them, acting upon them, thereby enabling us to become uh, the children of God through his covenant, becoming immortal, becoming perfected, adopting, inheriting all that God has to, to offer, being empowered and enriched by him. Those are the benefits of the covenant. That's what he's talking about here. It's the only thing that it is even remotely possible that he's talking about here. And he wants us to put the pieces together. And that's the whole idea of the way God teaches. Is, is put the pieces together. Look at what I'm saying and, and come up with what is the best, most accurate, most consistent rendering of these words so that you're, you've gone through the process of engaging in such a way that you transition from knowing to understanding and from understanding to responding now he's going to go on to say and so you should choose to literally and completely remember everything associated with the way which beneficially Yahweh your God has walked with you these 40 years in the wilderness in order for you to respond to approach exerting yourself through the process of learning and understanding this goes on to say that and so you should choose to literally and completely remember everything associated with the way which beneficially Yahweh your God walked with you these 40 years in the wilderness. Now, what is the way? Are there multiple ways? Are there, did God give lots of alternatives as to, uh, as to what we should uh, do as it relates to walking uh, to him and with him? No, he didn't. He only gave one. And the way uh, that he gave is the way that's emblazoned in the very history of the, of the Exodus. 
the Exodus began, and they began to walk with Yahweh on Pesach Passover, where lives were spared, signifying the Passover as the source of immortality. The next day began with Matzah, and taking the yeast out of our bread, representing religious and political sin. We're going to leave that behind in Egypt. Not going to take that with us. Uh, signifying being perfected by God, saved by him. The next day was Bokorah, where these children, the children of Yisrael, were adopted into God's family. They are now his people, his children, which is why he walked with them, led them across the wilderness. It's why he protected them initially as they were uh, being pursued by the military of the most religious and politicized place on earth. God kept the Egyptians' military at bay with a wall of fire. And then as on the Weba Beach, on uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, a portion of the Red Sea, as they were all gathered uh, there and hemmed in, God uh, made for a land bridge that went right across the, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba leading them into the Arabian desert. When they had crossed, he removed the fire that separated the advancing Egyptians from his children. And then uh, <laughs> once the Egyptians were in the midst of the Gulf of Aqaba, they were drowned. <laughs> Their chariot wheels can still be found on that land bridge. The land bridge that crosses from Nueva Beach can be uh, seen as uh, as well in uh, depth chart uh, of the Gulf of Aqaba, there's a column on both sides that commemorates the uh, the crossing and Yahweh's favoritism, his his guidance of his children. They then uh, entered uh, the uh, Arabian Peninsula and uh, were taken to Mount Horeb. And on Mount Horeb, they saw Yah's blazing glory, his his brilliant nature. You can Google Mount Horeb and you will see in Arabia where the top of this rocky mountain is charred even to this day. It's black. You can see where Moshe was asked to speak to the stone but struck it and, uh, and the thirst of the children of Israel was quenched. You can see the very crack that the water flowed out of in abundant supply. You can see the place where they made an altar to uh, Baal, to the golden calf, and, uh, and Yahweh had to deal with them. But you will also know that, that it was on Shavuah, after fulfilling in the right order, on the right day, this path that God had provided for his children, a Pesach, Matzah, Bakodam, that on Shavuah is when he revealed the Torah, telling us that Shavuah is the means for us to be enriched by his teaching and empowered by his covenant. That's the path that Yahweh delineated. He never ventured away from that path, never has, never will. Those are the first four days for us to meet with him. And you might wonder, wait a minute, aren't there seven? Yes, there are seven. There are seven annual days every year that we are invited to meet with God. The first four we just discussed. There are three more. Now, the reason that Yahweh fulfilled the first four during the Exodus as they were, as he was walking with his children through the desert, as this is explaining, is those first four facilitate all four uh, of, uh, and actually five of the promises associated with the covenant. Uh, it is through Pesach that we live forever which was mentioned in this uh, recap. It is through Matzah that we are perfected. It is through Bakudim that we are adopted, becoming heirs. And it is through Shavuah that we receive empowerment and enrichment, which was also mentioned in this review. That is Yahweh's way. He enabled the benefits of the covenant through those fulfillment of those first four mikra. It's also why Yahusha and the set apart spirit fulfilled all four of the first uh, of the 
first four of seven micrae in the fourth millennia of human existence in 33 CE. You'll notice a pattern. He became the Passover lamb. His soul went to Sheol on matzah to relieve our souls, de-yeast them, to take the fungus of yeast, religious and political oppression, away from them, so that we could be adopted into Yahweh's family on Bechutim, first fruits, firstborn children. He celebrated all three of those days in succession, in 33 CE, and then seven Shabbat, seven sevens later, he would celebrate the festival feast of Shavuah of the promise of sevens, where the spirit and the Torah came upon the children that had been adopted into the covenant, and they were enriched and empowered, as are we on that day. Yosha also fulfilled the first for Moed Mikre. But there are three more, and these three more will be fulfilled in our not-too-distant future. They are, of course, uh, the first of them, of the unfulfilled three, our Teruah, which is where Yahweh's children, now enriched with his teaching, empowered by his spirit, adopted into his family, share what we have learned. Share the opportunity to become part of his family. Tell people who will listen the dates that we can meet with him. Um, convey Yahweh's message out of his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. That is our opportunity. And we celebrate that opportunity on Teruah. And then on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Reconciliations, we celebrate the ultimate reconciliation of the children of Israel that walked, whose forefathers walked through this desert, this wilderness, with Yahweh and into the Promised Land. We celebrate their ultimate reconciliation back into the covenant family. They are estranged now, not all of them, most of them. But in um, 2033, as the tribulation comes to a close, before Yahweh's return, they will reconcile their relationship, and they will do so because they will come to recognize Yahweh as God. They will come to recognize the role that he has played in their salvation. And so we will celebrate each year this ultimate reunion on Yom Kippur. And lastly, we celebrate each year what our eternity is going to be like on sukkah, on shelters, where we're given the opportunity to camp out, <laughs> excuse me, with, with our God. So that is what Moshe is encouraging those who listen to Yahweh, reveal his Torah to them, those who walked through this wilderness with Yahweh as they are preparing to enter the promised land and camp out with God. He said, so you should choose to literally remember and literally and completely remember everything associated with the way which beneficially Yahweh your God walked with you. And that is the uh, nature of God. He provided us the way. He communicated it. He walked it. He reinforced it. He conveyed it in, into, in writing, enshrined it in his Torah, and he is encouraging us to pay attention to us, it, to understand it and to act upon it. Remember it. And everything associated with the way which beneficially Yahweh your God walked with you these 40 years. 40 is important here. Because 40 is a time of, uh, of testing. It is a time uh, that is always repeated as we look at the era of eras of human existence. Um, the other period of time is that is also important is seven times seven plus one, the model of Shavua um, when the Torah was revealed. And that's the celebration of Shavua is, is the day that that uh, Yahweh began to reveal his Torah to Moshe. And Shavua is this pattern of seven times seven plus one, the promise of seven, seven times seven plus one. And that means it's 50 years. And every 50 years, according to Yahweh, in the same uh, book of the Torah, God says that every 50 years, uh, all debts are forgiven and slaves are freed. And we get to return back to the land. And so it is every 50 years that we have a Yobel year, a time of Yah's Lamb being God, and celebrated as such. And if you were to multiply 40 times 50, 
you get 2,000. And so if you look at human history, it was very shy, uh, very little shy of 6,000 years ago in 3968 BCE that Adam and Shawa were expelled from the garden. 2,000 years thereafter, Abraham and Yahweh worked out the terms and conditions and benefits of the covenant, and God made his promises regarding the benefits of the covenant to Abraham, the very thing we're talking about in this passage. That was in 1968 BCE, 40 times 50, 2,000 years. 40 times uh, 50 years, or 50 Yobel, from the time that the covenant was memorialized with Yahweh and Abraham on Mount Moriah, on that exact same mountain, exactly 2,000 years later, in what now is year 4,000 Yah. Yahweh, through Yahusha, fulfilled the first four Moed Mekre, the first four invitations to meet with him, Pesach, Matzah, Bakodim, and Shavuah, so that he could honor the promises he had made to his covenant's children. And 40 Yobel from that time, on uh, in the same place, Yah was going to return. It'll be year 6,000 Yah, 2033, on our pagan calendars. And he will come to fulfill the last two, Mikre, because he will already have fulfilled Teruah, harvesting his covenant's children as a gleaning before the beginning of the tribulation. But on the day of reconciliations, on our pagan calendars, that is... October 2nd at sundown, 6.22 p.m. in Jerusalem on that day, in 2033, Yahweh will return. That is the way that God has beneficially walked with us. Welcome back to the last segment of Shattering Mist for today. We're considering the context of the statement in the Bariyim of Deuteronomy that uh, Yosha cited uh, relative to the uh, turning the rock into leavened bread. Uh, and it uh, goes on to say, and so you should uh, choose to literally and completely remember everything associated with the way, which beneficially Yahweh, your God, walked with you um, these 40 years in the wilderness. And keep in mind here, uh, God is, is open in here. This is forever. All people, all time, all generations, anybody that wants to engage and endure with God, that we are to pay close attention and remember everything that he said regarding his way. Which means that Pauline doctrine cannot be valid. God did not tell us to remember everything he had to say uh, regarding everything he had to do uh, regarding his way, only to uh, forget it and discard it. In order, he says, for you to respond, Anna. That's if we don't know what God has said and what God has done, if we don't know what God is offering through his covenant, it's impossible to respond. So if you ask a Christian, well, you, know, you think you're saved, well, are you a, a member of the covenant? Well, mom, mom, a new covenant. Well, there, there is no new covenant. Are, are you a participant in the covenant? Do you know what the covenant's terms and conditions are? Have you responded to them? And no. And you can't respond to them unless you know what they are. And you could ask a thousand Christians, and there's not one of the thousand Christians that could give you even one of the five terms and conditions of the, of the covenant. And if you don't know what they are, you most certainly can't respond to them. That's why God wants you to know them, to observe them, to, uh, to remember them, and to act upon them. In the wilderness, for, in order for you to respond, to approach by exerting yourself through the process of learning and understanding, and that's all, of testing and evaluating, uh, observing and experiencing, so that you come to know and become known, la yada. That's the whole process of thinking. The very thing that we've been doing these last two days is looking at the words, making the connections, understanding what's at stake. What are we being told by God? What are we being offered by God? How do we to know how do we come to know what he's talking about? How do we come to respond to what he's talking about? How do we come to understand it? And that's what he's telling us here. You know? 
focus on it. Pay attention to the terms and conditions of the covenant. Closely examining and carefully considering it. Reading it. So that we can remember it. So that we can respond to it. So that we come to learn from it and test it, evaluate it. Come to know what God is offering. Become known by him. La yada. So that beneficially and relationally, that is what we incorporate into the literal fabric of our being, into our heart, regarding whether or not you will consistently and genuinely, closely observe and consider the terms and conditions of the covenant. He, he ends this statement the way he started it. That all of this really focuses on a single concept. Are you going to observe the terms and conditions of the covenant, the mitzvah, shama mitzvah? The terms and conditions of the covenant are the, are the basis of us being part of God's family, of having a relationship with him, and being saved by him. So, you need to focus on them. You need to observe them if you're going to receive any of these benefits. It's why the essence of the second statement that God etched in stone on those, the first of the two tablets, and everyone just thinks it says, don't carve an idol. Oh, I'm good with that. I haven't carved an idol today. No, the essence of it is observe the terms and conditions of the covenant. He says, that's how you receive my mercy. He's telling us, walk away from religion. Don't be religious. Instead, observe Shamar, Mitzvah, the terms and conditions of the covenant. He goes on to say, your clothing did not wear out on you and your feet. They did not swell for these 40 years. So that you would know, recognizing and acknowledging with your heart that indeed, in the manner which beneficially a man instructs and corrects his children, Yahweh, your God, teaches and admonishes you, providing guidance regarding that which is potentially harmful while revealing the consequences. He is giving us a vivid example of how we should look at his Torah. That his Torah is designed to be fatherly advice. Even in the mundane uh, example of God took care of his children, he put shoes on their feet that did not wear out. He enabled them to endure this time because he protected them. He treated them like his children. He acted like their father. And all of the Torah exists to teach us, to admonish us, to correct us, and to guide us.